Okay, good evening to everybody. Um, again, my name is Mitch Weisberg, and I'll be hosting with uh, Sherry Crowfoot and Lenny Symes tonight. We're looking forward to a really interesting discussion on uh, personalized, uh, customized learning, and uh, to see if we can move schools forward. Now, there's a few features of Shindig that I want to make sure that we cover uh, before we start, uh, and that is, Beneath each one of your icons, there's the raise hand and ask question button. Uh, raise hand. We're going to ask, we may ask you a few, night, a few times during the evening. Uh, please raise your hand if you'd like to go on stage. Uh, please raise your hand um, if, you'd, uh, if you have a question. And, and the raise hand button is something that I, as the administrator, can see. And then next to it is something called ask question. Now, when you ask a question that way, I see it. So that's a great way to ask a technical question. Um, but the, uh, but, but uh, Sherry and Lenny will not see it. So if you want to ask them a question directly, then probably the best thing is if you use your cursor to hover over your icon, you see that there's a five item menu there. Uh, one of the items is I am. And if you click that now, you'll get a screen that, that allows you to type in messages. If you type in something in IM, then Sherry and Lenny and everybody else participating can see that question also. And there may be a few times in the evening where we ask you uh, to type in things into the IM button. For example, we may say, uh, describe all the time, you know, describe an interesting time where uh, you have personalized a class for the student or some of the things that get in the way of personalizing classes. And then we'll ask for you to put the responses into the IM. Now, uh, Sherry and Lenny will be able to see that. I, as the administrator, unfortunately, will not. Uh, so again, if you want to ask me a question, you're going to click Ask Questions. And if you have a comment or a question for Sherry, Lenny, or the other participants, you're going to click IM. And then uh, the final thing is to make sure that your uh, the lock button is unlocked and that and that allows you to participate with the other people here uh, for the, our small group work. So uh, because participation is such a big part of EdChat Interactive, I think it's a good uh, warm-up exercise. Um, I'm going to change this uh, this one a little bit, but what I'd like you to do is I'd like to click you to click on the avatar of another person here. And I'd like you to just talk about them, you know, who are you and why are you here? And maybe talk about what, you're, what you've done to personalize learning in your classes. So it's, um, it's 8.05 here on the East Coast, uh, 6.05 Mountain Time. So I think I'll just give you about two minutes to interact with each other. And I'm going to pull myself down. Uh, please click on the icon of another person and introduce yourself. Describe why you're here and describe uh, one of your experiences in your classrooms with personalization. Well, I see a few of you have had a chance to try that out. Uh, so I hope you got a chance to, to talk to each other. Uh, I do want to point out that tomorrow night we have another EdChat Interactive. Tomorrow is going to be featuring Jeff Bradbury of TeacherCast. And he's going to be talking about digital narratives and how to create characters that you can use in your class uh, to tell stories uh, about whatever su subject you're teaching. And then our, one after, our session after that is January 25th, which is with Gravity Goldberg. So it's part of our Corwin Authors series. And that's going to be on inspiring independent reasoning. You can, and since you, you're here, you know how to sign up for them because just go to our, our website, EdChat Interactive, to sign up. But tonight, we have a really interesting session in front of you with uh, Sherry Crowfoot and Lenny Symes. Uh, Sherry is a longtime friend of mine. Um, and as a matter of fact, she uh, helped me after I'd had surgery on my leg. And I mistakenly went to a conference and um, was in a great deal of pain walking. So, uh, so I owe her. <laughs> and uh, they're going to be talking about personalized learning. Uh, they both work for an organization called TIE. Uh, out in South Dakota and have traveled all over the, the West uh, working with schools on um, improving teaching methodology. So I'm going to stop the slideshow and I'm going to bring up uh, Sherry and Lenny onto the stage and there you are. 
So um, we're uh, we're having a forecast here for our first snowstorm in around New York City this weekend. But you guys have already had snow, haven't you? We have, and now it's actually been in the 30s, which is may sound cold to some people, but I didn't even wear a coat in today, so we liked <laughs> yeah. it. Cool. And um, maybe you can just describe a little bit about what Thai does and what you do with Thai. Okay. Well, first of all, you probably should understand that Thai is technology and innovation in education. We are a nonprofit agency, so we go out and we work with schools basically all over South Dakota and Wyoming, although we've branched into some other states. Um, both of us tend to work with a lot of technology. Um, Lenny does a lot of data stuff, and he's kind of dragging me into some of that kicking and screaming. But we work with curriculum, and, and what other things do you want to add, Lenny? No, all of the above. Uh, I, most of the time we look at our services, it's what does a school need. So, we, so Lenny, could you just talk a little bit louder? Sure. So when we uh, when we work with the schools, we try to customize actually our work with the schools. So it depends a lot on the request of the school. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, do you want me to then pull myself down and pull up the slides so you guys can get started? Sure. We're ready. Okay. Let's go. All right. Okay, so tonight we are here to talk to you about customized learning. Um, Lenny and I have been working on this for, well, probably five years for sure, but the last year and a half we've been in deep. Um, so we're going to talk to you about some of the things that we've been doing, some of the things we've created, um, some of our beliefs about this whole system, and some things that you might be able to do to get started down this path wherever you're at. So um, Mitch, could you go on to the next slide? We know that, that times have changed and you know a lot of things in our world are doing differently. We we don't go to the library as often anymore because we can check out library books right on our Kindle through Overdrive. Um, I read a lot off of my device and I was an English teacher so that took me a while because I really love books and, and the look and feel of them but I've adapted because it's just easier. Um, you don't always go to a to an actual place to go to college anymore. You can do that online. Um, travel agencies are going out of business because of places like Priceline and TripAdvisor, that kind of thing. Starbucks can now make your coffee when you walk up to them 87,000 different ways. But we're not customizing what we do for our kids. Amazon is my favorite one to talk about because when I go into Amazon, it recognizes me right away it makes suggestions based on purchases that I've made or even things that I've looked at. We gather information on our students all the time, but we don't really use that to help them. So on the next slide, we talk about how schools haven't really changed over all of this time. We went from the one room schoolhouse, which actually wasn't a bad model because they were customizing for kids, but then we got into the industrial age and we did the rows. Now we think we've changed things because we group them at tables. It's really not much different. And I've added a picture of here in here of me when I was still in the classroom. I was I was kidding around when we took the picture, but I was pulling my hair out, and that's frequently how I felt actually. Um, it felt like the harder I worked, I just wasn't making the progress I thought I should make, and I was really frustrated by that because. Um, I really enjoyed being in the classroom. I loved working with kids, but I, I worked really, really hard, and I didn't feel like I was getting anywhere. So five, six years ago, we actually got to read the book, Inevitable Customized Learning, prior to it actually going to print. We read it in a PDF copy, and the book itself really changed my thinking. Um, it made me realize that I was working really hard in a system that wasn't working really well for our students. So it really changed up some things in my thinking process. And as I've done more research into this, I really am completely on board that we need to change how education is being done. So we're going to go on to the next slide, and then um, I'm going to have Mitch break us down so we can be in some groups. But I want you guys to talk about amongst yourselves, what do you think customized education is? So Mitch, can we, can we go to a discussion here?
Yes. Okay, so this is the time for you all to interact with each other. And you'll notice that Sherry and Lenny also have an icon, so you can click on them and you can talk directly with them. Uh, this, so uh, we're going to give you probably about uh, three or four minutes uh, to talk about this question. What do you think education is? And then we'll uh, call up Sherry and Lenny again, and, um, and they'll, they'll tell us what to do next. I'll leave the question up. Okay, so let's let's bring uh, Sherry and Lenny back up. Okay, so I, I saw you got a chance to talk to somebody. We did. So, and she had some really so, great ideas about, you know, the diversity of kids and how we should be meeting the kids where they're at. And I think that's a really good thing to talk about with customized education. Also, we talked mm -hmm. about, you know, pace and how kids need to be able to move at their own pace, which makes the classroom look a little more chaotic because kids are doing things in all kinds of different ways. But mm -hmm. um, it really is about the kids. So would you like to, I, I was wondering, do you want to bring her up or? Would she to talk like about... to come and chat with us? So Myla, if you, if you, if you're willing to come up, why don't, can you just uh, click on the raise hand button? Uh, if you don't, then I won't bring you up. And I'll, okay, great. So I'm going to bring her up for the discussion. One okay. second. No, no. Hi, Myla. Do you want to tell the whole group what we were chatting about? Yes, you did a really good job with the recap. Oh, I've been eating. Sorry. <laughs> and um, I um, actually have one more thing to add. But yes, I was saying it's important to think about how to meet the needs of diverse learners in the classroom. And um, the one thing I've thought about, um, I've done a little bit with data driven decision making, um, you know, going through a process so you understand um, what the needs are of each student based on, you know, some of the data that has been collected. But I think when you talked about the chaos in the classroom and it might, you know, look you know, I guess a scattered, you know, that noise is always good noise to me. And um, I was just jotting down a note. There was an article that I came across um, probably when technology was really becoming prevalent in schools and it was in the ISI journal. And it was called, if, I, if I'm teaching this way, am I doing my job? And it was a situation where a principal walked past the classroom. One classroom, the kids were in rows, really, really quiet versus the, the class around the hall it was very noisy and kids were moving around and kind of doing their own thing. And it was really talking about that constructivist approach. And I kind of think a lot about that, you know, when you think of customized learning, it's just not going to be a quiet classroom and kids are going to be moving about and the room makeup of the room may not even look, um, you know, the way people anticipate them or to look. We saw that in one of our South Dakota schools and they had, uh, yeah. Down the customized road where teachers are spending more time working with small groups and individuals in their class time as opposed to up front talking. And even though they'd spent months going over with parents what the new program was and how it was heard, you still had uh, parents who perceived that teachers are standing in the front and talking to all the students, they're not teaching. And so you really not only have to rethink how you use classroom, but you have to think how you re-educate the public, customized environment. Mm -hmm. I um I had the pleasure recently of doing a site visit in Baltimore County Schools in Maryland, and um the, the school we visited uh, the name just escapes me, but um. They were doing an excellent job of the personalized learning and the, the students were so used to visitors that we were able to just kind of walk up to different groups and talk to them about what exactly we're working on. So I know one of the teachers said it took a while for the, you know, for it to kind of get that rhythm, but the students really embraced it and they had their different activities that they were working on, you know, based on their um, individual learning needs. Yeah, let's, we're going to go ahead and move back. Thank you for coming up and chatting with us. And I'm going to turn this over to Lenny because I rarely let Lenny talk if I can avoid <laughs> it. But before I do, while the slides are coming up, I did want to add one other thing. Um, we're really excited because this year we got a $4 million Bush grant, which is allowing us to do this. And this year we're taking on 10 schools in South Dakota. 
We're going to add, I believe, another eight next year. So we're super excited that we're actually out in schools that are moving. Either they started and we're helping them move forward, or they hadn't started yet and they are eager to start. So I just wanted to add that before I let Lenny go to the next slide. Sure. All right. What I wanted to explain is uh, this project that Cherry and I have been working on. One of the things that we've noticed with schools is that even when they buy in and say, yes, we want to do customized learning, we want to rethink how we do pace, how do we do time, how do we do space, how do we do the different paths for students. But the issue is, how do you get a district as a whole from one place to the next? And so what we did is we came up with what we consider a pretty uh, comprehensive program to help districts move in that direction. Now, I don't want this to sound like it's a sales pitch. Really, what we're talking about here is a program that any district could imitate and adopt. But it is something that uh, we do offer to schools, and we do it either through the grant or sometimes schools will contract with us. We want to share what that program looks like. So I think I'll go to the next slide and just talk about the two sides. We've got professional learning and the structural rebuild. And I'm going to focus first on the professional learning. On the one hand, most teachers can do some personalization in their class by themselves. But you really need also the district making some structural changes to how we do things. So Sherry's going to talk about that piece a little bit. I'm going to focus more on the, the teacher side. Originally, when we started getting forward, moving forward with this, our main issue was uh, how do we get teachers to the place where they're ready to look at uh, customized learning? So that if the district's going through a, a change process, how do we have the teachers ready when that process starts to happen? And so we put together this professional learning package that walks teachers and uh, other educators in the district through some skills that they may need to be uh, ready for a customized learning buyer. What you'll notice is that none of these classes are actually about um, uh, customized learning by itself. They're actually little micro units, if you will, on the types of skills they need to get there. So I'm going to jump to the next slide and show you one component of this is the online classes. We put together these self-paced online classes. We went and talked through a whole lot of topics and we really have more than nine, but we drew a line in the sand and said, we've got to start somewhere. And so we put these nine one credit classes together. The way we do it at TIE is we do them self-paced. There is no start and end time. What we have are uh, classes that teachers can sign up at any time. They start working through the materials. They work with the facilitator and turning in assignments and that. If they get busy and company shows up for two weeks, they could drop it for a while and then come back and work on it some more. So they really get a fully self-paced class uh, in working through these. What we've been working with districts is we ask that uh, if you'll notice they're put into groups of three, three different series of three, if you will. In each series we thought intentionally about putting together classes that uh, one conceptual class with two more hands-on types of classes. And we tried to group them in ways that the content would intermingle with each other very well. So you'll notice we have a series <coughs> that uh, involves uh, for example, flipped classroom, uh, project-based learning, and uh, student engagement. We have another series on online learning, blended learning, and student motivation. And then a third series around digital literacy, which is near and dear to my heart. Flexible curriculum and self-directed learners. And so the idea being that if we go into a district and work with them, they can have teachers choose which series they want to work with. So it doesn't mean the whole staff has to do the same thing at the same time. We actually tried to customize the online piece of this. Did I forget anything, Sherry? No, um, but we do want to point out, even though we offer these classes, these topics we feel like really do lend themselves to giving a teacher the skills. So if you didn't, you know, again, we don't, we're not pushing for you to hire Ty. Okay. 
Um, but if you were going to emulate this yourself, these are some topics that we feel like have some real um, push to changing mindsets in teachers. Now, uh, go ahead and jump to the next slide. The, the real core to this is that we didn't want it just to be about some classes and some professional development. We actually wanted to create a customized environment for the teachers themselves. So not only do you have the online classes, but we put together some face-to-face -face sessions that create more of a blended learning experience. Part of the issue, though, is if you've got teachers who are in all different types of classes, no one's taking the same class at the same time, we wanted to have the face-to-face -face experience be on topics that complement anywhere that they are in the other classes. If you'll notice uh, some examples of our face-to-face -face topics here, um, higher order thinking skills and complex reasoning, uh, flexible grouping. How do you handle, if not all the kids are moving through at the same pace at the same time, how do you manage having kids move around to different groups? One of the things we don't want people to think is that this is tracking grouping. This is really about a student may work with these students for a while, then they may work with these students for a while. It really is a true grouping. Assessment, you have to take a whole different approach to assessment if you're going to do a truly customized environment. And so we have to spend some time working on that. Technology immersion, what we're talking about here is any school can be a one-to-one -one school where you have the technology in place. That doesn't mean the instructional practices change once you have it. And so we really want to talk about what does it mean to immerse your content and your, your instruction in technology. And then one other piece that we think is about very important is the whole mindsets. If you've read the book Mindsets, you may know what I'm talking about with growth mindsets versus mixed uh, mindsets. Also, your just whole school culture, the, the whole role of the teacher changes as well. And so these are all things that we decided to put into a face-to-face -face component that we would work with teachers over the course of a year or two or three years. And uh, it, would, it would match well with their online study as well and, and create an environment where they're truly getting a customized environment in the professional learning. And these topics actually work a little better with discussion and face-to-face, -face, um, you know, talking through this versus a self-paced class. So we did take the topics that were better served with a face-to-face -face discussion. We placed them here versus the online classes. The other side of this that we really wanted to push was that uh, teachers often like credits. If they're going to put in the extra work, they want credit for what they've done. And so all of these have uh, a, a credit. All the nine classes have their own credit. The face-to-face -face pieces, if we do enough hours face-to-face, -face, we can also apply a credit for that. And then if you jump to the next slide, uh, we also have a culminating activity. What we ask is for teachers when they've learned about all these different pieces in their online classes and then they've also done some work in the faith, what's a culminating activity where you could put it all together? If you did three different set online classes, can you put all of that con together, content together along with what we learned in a face-to-face -face setting and create a culminating project that shows how you're applying that in your classroom setting? We also offered this as a separate credit. So a teacher in a traditional way of walking through this could get maybe five credits over the course of the year, actually implementing pieces of our customized learning. And so uh, we really tried to make this as practical as possible for the teachers to experience personalized, customized learning, while at the same time applying it into their classroom while they can. And I would like to add that on the culminating activity, we try wherever possible to push people outside of their comfort zone, you know, think outside the box. And these culminating activities, we would encourage if it was a primary grades, elementary schools, that maybe two teachers from adjacent grade levels work together and create a project that would blur the lines of the grade level. You know, have kids working at ability levels versus, you know, the traditional grade levels. If it was in the secondary, we'd have maybe two teachers work together um, in different subjects. You know, math and science do kind of go together, so we could have them work on projects that are outside their traditional classroom box. So we are going to push thinking on this culminating activity. 
All right, I think we're up to the discussion point, so let's go ahead and jump to the next slide. What we'd like to have you have, uh, if you have a chance to talk with some other people, how would you see an approach like this help teachers move toward a customized learning uh, situation? What do you see missing? What would, what would uh, help enhance uh, a program like this? Okay, so this is another chance for you all to interact. And let me say, there's, there's two different ways to, to interact right now. Uh, one would be to click on the avatar of somebody else who has video, and you can get into a video conference with them. The other thing is that, uh, again, it, it, there's that IM button underneath your icon, and if you click on that button, you can you can have a text discussion with the other participants here, and that might not be a bad idea either. So if you don't have video, what I suggest you doing, why don't you put a few of the answers into the IM box and start typing in but you know how you see this approach or whether you see this approach helping teachers move towards customized learning and to the extent that it doesn't or something is missing maybe describe what is missing I'll bring myself down and uh, let you let you talk for a little bit and uh, may, and maybe uh, we'll pull up in another two or three minutes Okay, so it doesn't look like you guys are a very chatty bunch tonight, which is fine. Um, Lenny and I are always willing to talk about this, so we have no problem with moving on. Um, but still feel free. I, I know nobody's added anything to the chat, the I am chat. Feel free to add things as you think of them as we go along. So, um, Mitch, if you would go ahead and go to the next slide, I'm going to go ahead and talk about the custom rebuild side, the structural rebuild side. And... Um, one of the things that I'd like to point out in this is that we were really um, moved by the book um, Inevitable, Math Customized Learning. And if you haven't read that book, it's a book I highly recommend. Um, it's about five years old now, so by ways of books, it's getting old, but it still has some really great ideas. In there, they talk about having 10 weight-bearing walls. And Lenny and I have gone through those weight the things that they feel like really stop from a structural standpoint us moving forward and changing from the industrial age and so we took the 10 weight bearing walls we've kind of narrowed them down to six and um, go ahead and go to the next slide Mitch. Well, while the slides are switching I do want to emphasize you hear a lot about personalized learning you hear a lot about customized learning and in some ways they're interchangeable but in some ways they're not I think one of the things that we see is is personalized learning is often teachers can personalize things in their classroom but truly customized environment they can't do it alone there have to be things that are changing. these weight bearing walls often get in the way and that requires some district planning absolutely so some of the topics that like I said we've narrowed them from 10 down to 6 the nine month school year and I know that schools have kind of played with that and some of them have gone to year-round school um, some of them you know they don't touch that that school year but we know that there can be a lot of learning done even if it's not in a traditional school setting in the in the summertime as well so that's one that needs to be looked at um, you know we talk about seat time we talk about you know mastery learning which we're very big believers in that mastery level of instruction in school learning versus in world learning and I think you know a lot of times you hear it talk about we need to give our kids real world problems but sometimes it helps if we take them into the real world for that learning to happen. Textbooks tends to be one of my least favorite subjects because I've really struggled with textbooks in different ways over the years, uh, but they tend to drive the curriculum in a way that I don't necessarily agree with. I think when I go into trainings and I ask people to bring their curriculum, so many times they bring the textbook. And to me, the textbook is supposed to assist in the curriculum, not be the curriculum. So we talk about rigid curriculum with flexible curriculum. I will add to that too, that it's not just the books and materials. Oh, yeah. even, even the adoption cycle of districts can be a barrier to a true customized learning environment. So it's it, it goes beyond just the material. Absolutely. Um, we talk about schedules, classroom assignments, periods. All of those things tend to get in the way. You know, I think all of us have had times when we've got the kids right in the palm of our hands and then the bell rings 
So there are a lot of issues that we could change to, to really get customized learning to where it needs to go. Grading systems and reporting to parents, I have to tell you, I was one that when they talked about, you know, maybe the ABC grading system wasn't what was best for kids, because what does an A mean? What does a B mean? I was a teacher that I loved my ABC grading system, and I knew exactly how to work that system. And so I was pretty hesitant when that one came up. And of course, the more research I've done, the more reading I've done, the more mastery level thinking I've gotten to, I have gotten on board with that. But some of these are going to be very difficult for your school to deal with because they're going to come across attitudes like mine was. So, so they're going to take some time. Lenny and I also decided that there were some things that over the last five years, perhaps the authors of this book didn't consider. So if you go on to the next slide, Mitch, we have a few other topics that we feel are really important for schools to talk about. Parent community relations, I know Lenny kind of uh, uh, talked about that earlier, about how you think you've prepared the parents for what's to come and you're not really you know, ready for the mindset that they have. But you have to really get your community on board if you're going to make massive changes to your school. Um, Ubiquitous technology and internet access, that's one of those that's really interesting. Even if you're a one-to-one -one school and you have technology and internet access in the school, do the kids access outside of school? Because we don't want the school day just to be from 8 until 3.30. It's got to be 24-7 for our kids. And there are ways to go about doing this. We work with a school in California that's a high poverty school and they've managed to get a grant to get um, some access to their kids outside of the school day. So there are ways around that. Um, LMSs were something that, um, a learning management system was something that in the beginning I didn't think was necessary to get started, but as we've gone we see more and more how important it is, particularly when you've got kids working on different projects and they're all in different places, and you really need to manage that and how, how and where the kids are at. Lenny talked earlier about, in the professional learning side, the um, web or digital standards. And we talk about it also over on this side as well, because that's something that's so important to our kids. Lenny has taught a class for the last probably four or five years on um, web literacy. And I've read several of the finals, and it's interesting because the teachers say, I thought I knew the web until I took this class, and I can't believe what I didn't know. So if the teachers don't know all of these things, they're certainly not passing it to kids. And the kids think they know how to run the internet. They think if you type two words in Google and you get a billion hits, you did a great job. But there are definitely better ways to search. There are better ways to think about using the internet. So it's a really important thing to discuss on a whole district level. Um, we also have on this list uh, modifying standards to learner outcomes or talking about spheres of living. And when we move to the next slide, we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But we really do have to look at, you know, our standards and, and whether or not we're teaching the, the spheres of living and preparing kids not only for college but for life itself. And I know that's gotten to be a big thing, you know, college and career ready in a lot of states. But we really take that seriously when we're doing this kind of thing. Do you have anything you want to add to that, Lenny, before I have it moved to the next slide? No, I think uh, we'll go with the next piece, which is the data piece. Okay. Um, we One of the things that, that we have done um, at TIE is that we really try to give our districts that we're working with some real um, data to work with. It's, you know, when we go in, and Lenny's done far more data retreats than I have, I kind of have avoided them, but when we go in and talk to teachers' data, they have data about test scores, they have data about grades, they maybe have data on attendance and behavior, but then what do they do with that, and how do they really move learning forward for individual students? So some of the things that we've done, um, oh, the... Lenny is always talking about how you can ask in a district, well, what are your teaching strategies? What, what happens in the classroom? And people think they have an idea of what happens in the classroom, but you really don't have data. You don't really know what's going on behind those closed doors if you don't, you know, access the data somehow. So we've gone through and we've created a number of surveys and we've um, 
we've actually started with um, a teacher survey, which is kind of a pre-survey. So we survey teachers even before we go into the schools and get some of their perceptions about, you know, what do you think about having all kids be more responsible for their own learning? Or what are some other questions? Help me. Well, we have all these different aspects of personalized and customized learning where they take a look at it and then they decide uh, what their perceptions are. And it helps a planning team to have a better idea of what teachers think about these weight-bearing walls that are in the place or about changing structure. What's most interesting in much of this data is it's not just what they agree and disagree with. Often questions will get a high number of undecideds, and that tells a district a lot. I think, about that. Absolutely. We've created another survey that runs very similar to that one for parents, so you can have some actual data about what your parents think. We also have some surveys that come a little later into the process that are for teachers, you know, kind of how do you plan for your instruction, what kind of things do you consider when you're when you're planning for your kids. Students, you know, what kind of instruction is their current instruction that they're currently receiving um, and, you know, what are their study habits kind of things. And then we have another survey for administrators because there's some data that we want to collect about what's going on in their schools. And, you know, from an administrator side, sometimes administrators, I hate to say this, but sometimes they can be a weight-bearing wall. So we need to know some of those perceptions going in as well. Any more on data? No, nope, I think we should do that. Okay, we've got another slide here to talk about one more piece that we've added to this. We really have added, even though we talk about this being a two-pronged approach, we've kind of added a third piece here, and that's what we're calling curriculum redesign. And it really has two parts. Um, one thing is, is that um, we're asking teachers, if they've taken the professional learning side, to start changing up some of the things that they're doing in their classroom. And the one thing I can promise you is, any changes like that that you're going to do, it takes time. And I have not found the magic wand to provide teachers more time. So we are, I know this summer we're going to be conducting for our South Dakota teachers a regional event. We propose in other states that we do either a district or a regional event where teachers can come together and work on some of this. We just, um, normally teach it in a traditional classroom. They have their curriculum. They create their own lessons. They do everything in the isolation of their own classroom. So when we start talking about completely changing how things are done in the classroom, I can imagine teachers going, well, I'm not going to create a hundred different IEPs and I can't create a hundred different lesson plans which has nothing to do with what we're talking about but those are some of the perceptions plus even if you're just going to change your traditional teaching that takes time we want to bring teachers together give them some time to work together bounce ideas off each other um, work together if you're flipping the class who would it be to do a video with another teacher maybe across the state from you or across the town from you and you guys are both working on it together. Or you change lesson plans, it, you know, you trade them out and you work together on that. So it doesn't come down on a heavy workload for any individual teacher. The other half of the curriculum though that we think it's really important that districts pursue is to look at it from a higher level, a, a district perspective, if you will. And in particular, if your district has adopted standards, something maybe similar to Common Core or, or other kinds of standards, one of the problems that we get into is the sheer volume of standards. Uh, the sheer volume can get in the way of customized learning because it's difficult for you to demonstrate mastery across hundreds or more of standards. The other problem that standards often bring into bear in customized learning environment is that they're very grade level oriented. And if you've got students who are working at mastery through different levels, the grade levels become irrelevant. And so districts need to rethink, how do we do our standards? Any district who's actually tried to do a, a, a standards-based report card knows what I'm talking about. What you discover is the volume of standards don't allow you to do a report card on every standard that's out there. What you have to do is uh, examine what are the broader areas within these standards, maybe what you call learning outcomes? And with those learner outcomes, what is it that we can do then to move students, regardless of what grade level they're in, and regardless of what age they are, 
it's based more on their mastery. So it, it takes some rethinking of curriculum at a larger level as well as the classroom redesign. So we, we, we see this as a component that fits into the structures we brought up already. The district doing the structural redesign, uh, excuse me, rebuild. You've got the teachers doing the professional learning. And this curriculum redesign actually covers both ends of that. So as a whole, I guess what we'd like to do in summary of what we've presented here is we really believe that for a district to move forward, you need a comprehensive plan. You need something on the district side of what structures you need to change. You need something on the teacher side as to what professional learning they need to do. And then you also need to look at how do we redesign our, our curriculum both ends. So uh, regardless of whether you have Ty do it or you do it yourself, we think that all these pieces are necessary in order to see customized learning and personalized learning be brought into the classroom environment. And I would like to add that on the structural rebuild side, all of the weight-bearing roles are the additional topics that we've talked about. We would come together and and work with a team that's, that's looking at that, but we bring some resources because you can't just go, yeah, that's a problem, so we're going to do this. You really need to do some thinking through it, doing some studies of some other places that have done it, look at some data. Um, we're not experimenting here in any way. There's a lot of data out every single piece that we've talked about that shows how this can benefit our students. So we can provide all of that to you as well and, and work with that team to make thoughtful decisions, not just jump in the deep end of the pool. So we have one more chance for you guys to share with each other. Um, you want to move to the next slide, Mitch. And we, I hope you guys will chat with each other. We, we want you to talk about, is your school or district ready for this conversation? Um, or what more could be done to help them get to a point where maybe they're going to consider moving on with it? And I am going to add here that if you follow the U.S. Department of Education, they've put out some um, articles lately about, in their tech plan even, about how we really are moving to, they call it personalized learning. We think we're going one step further. But this is becoming a national conversation. This isn't something that's just the new silver bullet that's going to fix education and then go away. I really do think this is inevitable. So let's go ahead and go to some um, discussion time. So, so, you know, just as long as we're discussing, uh, I thought I'd ask some questions also. Uh, if, if, I were, if I were a teacher in a school and, and I really wanted to make sure that my students uh, had personalized, customized learning and, I, you know, uh, and my school wasn't really ready for it, what could I do other than well, switch schools? <laughs> well, there's a lot of things you can actually do to personalize in your individual class. Um, we talk about some of that in the classes that we offer, but I can just give you an example. We have a school that we're working with where the math teacher decided that the way he taught middle school math just wasn't working. So he started by flipping his classroom, and then once he started flipping, he realized there was more he could do. So now he has a whole menu of options that the kids can do so they have a lot of choice in how they're going to show mastery in the class. So you really can jump in and start making those changes in an individual class. It won't be as effective as if they do the whole thing, but you can definitely start moving your kids a little further. And hopefully if you start showing some real success in your class, it will get your district excited to start moving in that direction as well. If it's an individual teacher, I would say they need to focus on, on pace. Are there ways that we can change the pace for students? And is there a way that we can provide a path? And one of the, the teachers that uh, Sherry mentioned, the math teacher, I thought one of his ways of phrasing it was, do we give kids authentic choice in how they learn? And if we can find ways to actually give them some authentic choice, that helps uh, get that one step closer. Mm -hmm. And you would brought up earlier about the, the culminating assignment that you have with your teachers. And it just one of the things that was occurring to me is that maybe as a teacher, I could work with, with some other teachers in my school and could design culminating assignments 
after certain units. And, and, and that would be just as it's effective for teachers for, for, or educators for professional development, it's just as effective for, uh, for students. Yes. We have, part of the reason that we talked about the structural read builds is that there's only so far that teachers can take that. You can have a pair of teachers uh, who want to cross grade levels and work across that, but you, you run into limits. If the rest of the school is all uh, laid out by grade levels, there's only so far you can take it. But there's still plenty of room where teachers can do some, some uh, cross-pollination, if you will, between students in working with other students at the same mastery level, regardless of what grade level they're mm -hmm. Have you heard of school districts where some of the teachers got together and convinced the the whole district or a whole school to change direction and implement these structural changes? Absolutely. Matter of fact, the math teacher that I was talking about a little while ago, his school has been so impressed by the changes that have happened in his class that other teachers jumped on board and now the entire district is looking at making the move. We worked with another school that they started with just one grade level. They started with ninth grade, and everybody in ninth grade went into a customized environment. Um, they found that that didn't work for everybody. So now mm -hmm. it's been very interesting because they've added a grade level every year. But they now have alternative school, which really is traditional school. Yeah. So for them, the norm now for their whole high school is customized learning. But if that doesn't fit your needs, if you really have learned how to play school and that's what you want to do, you can go into the alt school, which is traditional learning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then cool. a few teachers got very excited. And so right now they're working within their district to see if they can become a part of the grant. So sometimes it is a bottom up piece. So maybe it's, it has to be a multi-year plan that maybe a teacher d uh, does a few things in her classroom in one year and gets some of the other teachers interested and then those teachers then plan some things together and then with the success that they have, they then move forward and convince the school and or district to move to, uh, well, to transform really as well. We just started these nine classes this fall um, and while they were designed largely or people that did the entire plan. We have schools, or we have teachers taking these classes that are not in our schools that are moving forward with the grant. Matter of fact, I think the majority of our teachers right now are not in our grant school. So we know that there's a real push from teachers that are hungry for changing how we're doing education. I think they're feeling like I was in the classroom, that they're working really hard in a system that isn't really doing what's best for kids. Mm -hmm. And that's hard. Yeah. So now, in one of the earlier slides, you talked about data and you talked about surveys that you did with teachers, students, and I think other groups too. Their administrators were in the group. Right, um, and parents. What do you try to get out of those? What's the purpose of those surveys? I mean, obviously a survey, you get answers, you get data, but how is that, how, how does the data change the actions that you might take? So the, when you look at, uh, for example, the students, what we do is we get the students to tell us what is a day in the life of the student really like. So we have very specific questions about how do you use technology in your classroom right now? What mm -hmm. kind of instruction are you exposed to? A list of different things. Uh, uh, how often do you have to do worksheets, let's say, versus how often do you... Oh, I love uh, worksheets. <laughs> That's probably the answer. We want more worksheets, right? Well, we would customize for you, and I would find you worksheets if that's what you love. <laughs> Never. And we also ask them the, the, how often do you work in a small group on a problem there is no single answer. Um, you know, we, we try to get those frequencies so that when you go and look at this, you get a snapshot of what is it like for students instruction-wise and how they use the technology. The teacher may have two different ones. We have the pre-survey about attitudes, but we also have a more in-depth survey about what kind of planning do you do about your instruction? What kind of things do you take into account when you plan for the instruction? So it, it gives us a glimpse into how teachers think when they go into planning. 
the administrators, it's more about the structures within the school. Mm -hmm. what, what structures do you have in place for professional development? What kinds of structures do you have in place for incentives for teachers and so on? So we get a little bit of a snapshot of, of that. And then the parents, it's mostly about attitudes in certain areas that if it's going to make some changes, are there going to be people who are supporting or are they going to have some resistance? So we try to look at it uniquely from each group. What do they offer? And then that gives them better data for how to approach and plan for it. And I will add that on the parent survey, there are mm -hmm. some questions about customized learning that I don't think they've even heard of before. So it allows us to put the topic out there, give them something to think about. And quite honestly, a lot of times parents just want to be asked how they feel about things. So by asking them, you're already getting them right. to think about it and kind of come on board with you. The main issue behind mm -hmm. the data and, um, the, the the main issue mm -hmm. with the data is we have a lot of data about test scores, about grade averages, attendance, but we really have very poor data about what kind of instruction is going on in a building. People will tell you what you, they think, but you don't have very good data. So the, the attempt is to try to get data about instruction. And it would seem to me also if I were a teacher or an administrator and I wanted to move in this direction, having surveys in me from the argument the whole district or the whole school should move. Is there a way for me to, would there be a way for me to have access to a, you know questions that I could ask my students before contracting? Is there are there any is there like a free download or something that I could get? We'll probably, we haven't put them up yet, but we'll probably have some sample reports so you can get an idea of what some of the questions are. But really all we did was look at just different elements of customized learning and then ask people, you know, are, are those, put them into statements. Do you agree with that or disagree? For example, um, mm -hmm. one of them that we use, even in a degree, they may have resistance to change. One of the questions we ask is, do you wish students took more responsibility for their work? And you'll almost get 100% of every school that's out there agreement from all their teachers on that statement. Mm -hmm. That's a first step in saying, OK, this is what we want to tackle then by going to a customized approach. Or okay. you ask uh, people, uh, do you think students could benefit from moving through material based on their mastery as opposed to a whole class going through it at the same time. What you're really mm -hmm. going after is, do you really think there's a possibility that there's a better way of doing it? And often teachers will say, you know what, I do agree with that. And so it's, it's a way of getting the foot in the door, even in places where you might run into resistance. Mm -hmm. OK, good. Now, uh, you'd asked me before to do a screenshot of your website. Uh, right. Or, or would you rather go on? Do you have some more slides? I know we're we're heading up to the end of the hour, but what we have is our contact information, so we do want to get that one up there at some time. Okay. But we do have a website where we are, and and I will tell you, it's looking better, but we're still working on it. Um, matter of fact, it'll be a work in progress for a long time. Um, this is going to this is where we're housing our online classes, so you can even go in and look at what we're what we're doing in our online classes. Um, we talk about all the pieces that we've talked to you guys about um, and, and just different ways that you can come about contacting us. And this is, the website is customizeyou.net and Mitch has that on the bottom there. So you can see this website and it will be on our um, contact slide as well. Um, it's kind of been our little baby where we put all of our, all, all of our information there. So. Mitch is putting up our contact information. Um, Lenny and I both have emails that tie. You can get us there. We both have Twitter accounts. Lenny has a Facebook account, but he doesn't ever go there. <laughs> um, you can catch me at Facebook if you want. CustomizeYou.net is our website, and then tie.net is our work website. So we've kind of separated this out from our work website so that we can put all the things on there we want to have go into customized learning. Otherwise, I think that's... Um, Unless you guys have questions for us, we're going to let Mitch kind of finish this up. And we really appreciate you coming and talking to us tonight. This is a subject that we're very passionate about. Really, um, I, I, really I, I didn't...
didn't get that at all. You did. I didn't, you really? I up a little bit more then. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, you know, thank thank you so much for for appearing. I think this was is a lot of really good information, and uh, and of course we we recorded it, so we'll have the archives. And if there's any information that you want to share, uh, that that you want us to put on on the website so that people can uh, can download in addition to the slides, uh, send it to me, and I'll I'll make sure that that's up also. Um, well, just and then, just a and, you know, view. Okay. All right. Um, that 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 will be there. And hope to see you at a conference soon, or or you know, real live in person. That'd be great. I'll be in DC this um, year. Okay. I'll probably be at SD also. I, so uh, I guess I'll, I'll say good night. Um, so have a good evening. Th thank you again. And this is Mitch Weisberg for EdChat Interactive. And I hope that uh, you all enjoyed this session as much as I did. And uh, hope to see you tomorrow night when uh, when we have Jeff Bradbury uh, talking about um, uh, digital literacy. So uh, see you tomorrow night. Good night.